couple of things. Let me go right to the Word. Today what I want to do is uh, I'm going to lay uh, a foundation for where we're going to be the entire year. Um, and we're going to spend the whole year on the theme of break out or breaking out. I think God is calling for something different. And it's time that we get there. So go with me to the book of John chapter 5. Um, John chapter 5, and I'm going to deal with verses 1 um, through 18 so we can kind of hear and see what God is saying. So I'm going to read this, then I'll do an uh, introduction, then we'll kind of walk through it. John chapter 5, um, verses 1 through 18. And um, those of you that are there, um, say amen. amen. Um, don't be afraid to use your phone to tweet somebody or to Facebook somebody and say, you should have been here. Yeah. Say, I don't know where you at, but God must have left where you were to come here. You know, <laughs> you just tell them that. Let me read. Let me read. It begins in verse 1 by saying, after this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, and I'm reading from the ESV, now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multiple of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And depending on what translation you have, my translation goes right to verse 5. It says, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Lord, have mercy. The sick man, the text said, answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now, interestingly enough, it says the day was the Sabbath. So the Jew said to the man, who has healed you? It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man, said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk. Verse 13 says, Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was. That's shocking. For Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why... Uh, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he were do, it was doing these things on the Sabbath day. And I like verse 17. But Jesus says, this is the Ebonic version, I don't care what none y'all say. I'm fitting to do what daddy said. That's what that verse says. Amen. <laughs> that's, that's what, that's, what, that's, that's the, the Ebonic version. That's what it says. Can we put a um, big idea on the screen? I kind of want to share a couple of things and then I'm going to talk to by way of introduction. Um, turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, break out. Now say it, now say it like, like that. Freak out. No, say <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry, y'all. Promise stay spiritual, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> tell your neighbor real quick, say, yeah. say break out. Yeah, tell him, come on. Now say, yeah, thank you. Now we go, there we go. One more time, say it again. Say, break out. Break out. Say, resolve to change. Yeah, come on, tell them again. Say, resolve to change. Yeah, very, very important. Yeah, not freak out, break out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, break. I'm going to stay safe. Good, good. Next, next. Put the next one real quick. Here's what I want you all to see. Um, back up, back up, back up right here. Now, this is what I want you to take away from the story. And if there's any way you guys can leave that on that back wall while I'm preaching, that'll be good because I want people to walk away from here with this. Jesus redeemed us from the grips of sin. And he challenges us to change our lifestyle so we can spend eternity with him. Yeah. Now, here's the funny thing about eternity. There is a future and there is a present aspect of the kingdom, right? And so what that means, this eternity could be when he comes to take us back, and it could also be now. Yeah, 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 yeah. My problem is I get in and out of eternity in the now, and I'm waiting for tomorrow. So he wants us, he wants to, he has come to redeem us from the grips of sin 
to free us up from some things and to challenge us to change our lifestyle so we can spend eternity with him. Does anybody in here know that change is difficult? Yes. Come on, y'all. It's hard, yeah. Some of y'all already broke your resolutions. You did, you did. Uh, and, you know, it ain't even, what, what's this, the third, is it? The third? Haven't even made it far. So I got good news for you. Um, go to the next slide real quick. I think I want to put this up on the screen uh, if, the, if you have that good. I would love to challenge every person in here to buy this little book. Now, you guys know I'm the academic person. So what this little book, let me tell you what it is. Um, the sad thing about being a pastor's kid is I get to mentor my own little son. So every time I am doing a new study or a new read, he has to go along with me. So Eddie had a chance <laughs> to read this book, and he read it in three hours. Um, he's getting used to reading what I give him, so he, he gets it, and he's growing. But the point was, when he finished with the book, he was running around the house for about a week. You can do it now! Do it! Do it! You can do it now! Do it! That's what he was saying. Quit procrastinating! And that's he was telling your mom, wasn't he? He was just, come on, mom, go to the gym. I'm going to go tomorrow. No, go now! Yeah. Yeah, he was pumped up. He, he <laughs> I had him read it for this little business that he has going to kind of encourage him. But it, it's a book by um, Jack D. Hodge. I have to read it as part of doing my dissertation for my doctoral project. But it's very, very good because it challenges you, especially if you're a business owner or you want to go into business. Um, it'll motivate you and prevent you from procrastinating. So I think it's a great way to start the year, just a little something to read. It shouldn't take you more than reading it while the Broncos are losing the day. Um, you, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. My cowboy's in the house, and I just, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so it's just a great little read. So now it done lost the whole church. Yeah, come back, come back, come back. They're going to win, they're going to win. Yeah, yeah. But read it. Um, it'll help you. In your journey, it's just something good I want you to read to kind of go through. Because um, one of the things we need to do corporately and structurally as a church is we have to learn to stick to our guns. We need to develop different habits and different systems and different things. Because if you've been here the length of time, we'll start something and then it'll fade out. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? So to get to vision, some change is needed. To get to your tomorrow, change is needed. And the things that have been plaguing us down for a very, very, very long time, Christ has come to redeem us. Um, and I added in a text from sin, you're going to see that. And he challenges us to change our lifestyle so we could spend eternity with him. The reason a lot of us can't enjoy life and can't move into tomorrow and have a great future is because we change too much. We'll start something and then we'll, I mean, we're wishy-washy. And we need to learn to change for the better so we can be consistent in what God would have us to be. The text that's in front of us, it kind of, it, it, it outlines for us an illustration of this man that I'm going to refer to as an in invalid. Now, what's striking about the text, and I'm going to do it a section at a time, is if you were to look with me at verse 1, notice what it says in verse 1. It says, after this, in verse, chapter 5, verse 1, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And it says, there, was, there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, and it says, which has five roof colonnades, and in these, they lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Now, repeat that to me. Say, Jesus has come to redeem me from my sins. One more time. Say, Jesus has come to redeem me from my sin. Okay. Now, don't for a moment, don't, don't make the mistake of thinking that, uh, that, that I'm not involved in no extramarital relationship. I'm not strung out on drugs or I'm not whatever, so I don't have a sin. Um, I'm going to guarantee that you got a sin. <laughs> we all do, okay? First John 1, I think it's verse 10, say, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves. So the point that I'm trying to make in that statement is that Christ has come to set you free. Now, what's striking about the narrative in the text is if you were to back back um, to the beginning of chapter 4, just for the sake of literary context, you will notice Jesus saying to his disciples that I must needs go through Samaria. 
okay? Now, the reason I need to take you that far back to get you to where we are today is what's striking about chapter 4 is he's telling to his disciples, I understand that Jews and Samaritans don't have no dealing, but today, um, January 3rd, 2016, I need to violate the normal route to go here because I've got something to do. Okay? Now, this is free. God has violated his route today because he has something that he wants done. Come on in our midst this morning. Are you with me? He goes there. He has this encounter with this Samaritan woman. Y'all know the story quite well. The entire town of Samaria comes to a relationship with God as a result of one reject. Okay? Then it continues on in chapter 4 where he encounters an official who says to him, my son is sick, come and heal him. Jesus releases a word, and then the man's son is healed, okay? So then we get to chapter 5, verse 1, and then the author opens up by saying, after Jesus had done what he normally does, which is violating the route because his goal is to seek and to save the lost, after these things, he decides to go to, I mean, to Jerusalem. Now, what's striking now about him going to Jerusalem is he's keeping in line with his norm of violating the easy and the normal route. Come on, say amen. Watch what the text says. Verse 1, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now look at the data that John has given us. Verse 2, now he says there is in Jerusalem, and it says by the sheep gate, a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades, and then verse 3 gives us some interesting details about Jesus' journey. In this place, it says there lay a multitude of invalids and blind and lame and paralyzed. Come on, say sheep gate. What's striking about the sheep gate that you need to know is the sheep gate was simply a small opening um, going into the temple of Jerusalem, and, and the design of this sheep gate and the reason the pool was there with these five covered colonnades is commentators are saying that this was the passageway through which they would pass the sheep to put them into the temple. But before they got into the temple, they had to wash the sheep and prepare it because that thing was about to go into the Holy of Holies. Come on, are you with me? Now, what's striking about this, this area of reject, because most righteous folk won't go there. They would, if they were going to the temple, you wouldn't find them going by the sheep gate. Matter of fact, they'd go around the front. It's kind of like Jesus coming to the party, and he's going through the back door where all the poor people hang out. I wish I had somebody, somebody in here. Because look at what the author says. At this gate, notice what he says, there was a whole lot of invalids or people that were laying there. Verse 3, there lay, and it says, a multitude, not one, a multitude. Okay, that's a deep word because that means many. <laughs> a whole lot of folk was there. And, and it says the type of people that were at this place, they were blind, they were lame, they were paralyzed, they looked like me, and they looked like you, and they had my issues, and they had, I wish I had somebody in here, and they had your issues, because I'm talking about societal rejects, okay? Come on, are you hearing me this morning, okay? Notice the text didn't say that there were church folks there. It didn't say there were no scribes or Pharisees, but societal rejects. And what I like about the first point is that Jesus violates the cultural norm and as opposed to coming through the front door and taking the reserved parking lot for his camel Mercedes and parking it right there, he, he goes around the back door where all the rejects are and he encounters somebody. Now, does anybody in here, are you happy today that Jesus chose the back door just to meet you? I don't know about you, but when he found me, I wasn't in church. Come on now. I wasn't sitting on the front row. I'm sure when he found some of us this morning, we were not in the places we ought to be, but I thank God that he violated the cultural norm and passed the route where rejects are to meet you and to meet me. Maybe you can't say amen because you've been saved all your life, but that's not my testimony. Come on, come on, y'all. Come on now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And I thank God it says he went through this route by the, the, the sheep gate, 
And he says there laid a pool where they would wash these sheep to take them into the temple. And all the folk who could not go into the temple were hanging out. Watch the text. Then it says here, one man, verse 5. Now, before I move on, let me, let me just, this is a parenthetic. Some of your translation has a verse 4. Are you with me? Depending on if you have an older translation, an ASV or a New King James or a King James. Um, the reason verse 4 is omitted, and this is an important point in a lot of the newer translations, is because it's a, a copious insert to explain why people were hanging around the pool. Okay? It's not an addition that is found in any of your earlier manuscripts. It's just a phenomenon that existed, and I'll talk about this in a little while. So in your newer translation, they've decided to omit it, and the reason they omit it is because they can't find it in any of the Greek manuscripts. You guys okay with me? Okay? So notice what happens now. Watch, watch the text as it picks up. Look at verse 5. It says now, one man was there who had been an invalid for what? A long time. That's a long time. 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he asked the man, do you want to be healed? Now, say 38 years. 38 years. Now, listen to me carefully, guys. That's a long time. Okay? Now, the reason I want to, uh, to, to press this point and I want you all to hear me in this point is because if you were to study history, um, very rarely would Jews in, ant in antiquity actually live past 40 years. So this man had this condition in his life for a particular a lifetime, okay? He was messed up, he was invalid, he couldn't walk, and the thing that he had didn't just happen to him, okay? Does anybody in here, and don't raise your hand, have a problem that you've been battling for a long time and you just can't seem to get over it? Oh, come on, come on, say amen, because I know I'm not the only one. You know, that, that thing that, you know, if I could just get this right, come on, I'll be okay. And, and, and you've had the thing since childhood, and now here you are, 90, almost hitting 100, and the thing still, come on, it's, it's still hanging around because you can't get it. It's been a long time. Come on, y'all. I mean, some of us have been in marriages for a long time, and it hadn't been right yet, but we're still faking the funk. And we're, come on, talk to me this morning. We've been in jobs for a long time that we can't stand, but we're still faking it. I stopped by to tell you this morning, Jesus has come to set you free and to release you from that situation. 38 years is a long time. It's a long time. And Jesus looked at the man and notice that he had been by the pool a long time. Now, the author is not saying that the man been by the pool for 30, 38 years. It's simply saying he had the problem for 38 years, and Jesus inserted that he's been trying to fix it for a long time. And he had compassion on him. The reason I'm saved today is because he had compassion on me. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. The reason you're saved is because he had compassion on you. Now, watch the text. So Jesus says to him, do you want to be what? Do you want to be what? One more time. Do you want to be what? Now, don't say nothing out loud. I'm asking you, do you want to fix it? Whatever it is, beginning of a new year, do you want to change it? If it's a cycle, if it's always finding myself here, always going through this, can't keep a job, can't stay married, can't release this thing, whatever it is, do you want to fix it? The reason I'm asking that question, because if you have not resolved in your mind to change, I am wasting my time and you are listening in vain. Do you want to change it? Because here's what Jesus said to this invalid. 38 years, dude, you've been sick, and you've been coming to this spot for a long time. You've been coming to this spot for a long time. So here's the deal. I can end this right now, Jesus said. But it's not up to me. It's up to you. <laughs> Come on, do I have two witnesses here? 
It's, it, come on, say it's up to me. Say it again. Say it's up to me. If you haven't finished school, don't blame the school. It's up to you. Come on, come on, come on. If, if you, <laughs> come on, talk to me this morning. If you haven't achieved in life, don't blame the man or blame circumstance. It's up to you. Come on. If you haven't released that addiction for such a long time, don't say they open new marijuana shops in town. No, it's up to you. Come on, say amen this morning. It's up to you. Do you want it fixed? Are you hearing me this morning? Now, watch this. The sick man answered him, sir, you don't understand. I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And then while I am going, another steps down before me. Okay, stop here. This is where verse 4 is missing. Verse 4 says that mythically, and hear me what I'm saying, tradition was that an angel would come down once every season. This is verse 4. And they would trouble the water, and the first person to get into the water, forget the rest of y'all, that one person would be healed. And the reason I'm glad that a lot of the new translations has omitted that particular verse is because I don't serve a God that serves first come, first serve. I serve a God that'll heal you. <laughs> come on. If, if you want it, you just come. So it, it, was, it was just tradition that they would say. And, and if you know anything, they didn't have exposure to a lot of the historical data that we have today. And who's to say it was probably an underground spring that every now and then the earth would shirk and then it would cause the water to move. Come on, y'all know this stuff today. And then steam would come and they say, oh, God showed up and they would jump in. But here's what I want y'all to lock in. Whatever medicine impact that pool had, it was not a permanent fix. So here's what we do. Jesus says, do you want to be whole? Well, what had happened was, <laughs> if, if, excuse the grammar, y'all, if them folk in the church would get it right, I'd go to church and I'd adjourn church. What had happened was, all those hypocrites that go there on Sunday morning, and then I see them at work, and they're acting all this crazy way. Yeah, I want to get healed, but they're blocking me. Lord, if you hadn't have given me that husband, I was really looking at that one, but you gave me that one. And if you had got it right the first time, I wouldn't have been, come on, y'all, to talk to me this morning. And, and we have all these excuses, and what we do is we miss the very person who is asking us and focus on the wrong thing and wonder why we're still stuck. Jesus never once said, do you want me to help you in the water? <laughs> never once. Because if you realize who you're talking to, you're in front of the very one who made the water. You're in front of the, come on, I wish I had somebody in here. You are standing in the presence of the very God who said there was, let there be, and there was. If you are resolving to change, now is your opportunity. Man had a litany of excuses. What had happened was, there's invalids that's not as bad as me. Doesn't matter your condition or situation. If Jesus has showed up to heal you, walk into healing. Come on, say amen. Okay, watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. So, so I like verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Look at verse 7. Excuses. I have no one to put me when the pool is troubled, so on and so forth. And look at verse 8. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed, and what? In spite of his excuses, Jesus still issued an imperative. Look at verse 9. And at once the man was healed. Stop. Let me, give me two minutes to do this because... For the deep folk in here, this is going to mess you up. Get up, take up your bed, and walk. Verse 9, and at once 
the man was healed. Stop. Listen carefully, people. Because of the fact that Jesus has come to redeem us from sins, we can be redeemed if we simply obey him. It's going to mess you up. It's going to mess you up. It's going to mess you up. Get up and walk. And the author puts a parenthetic in the text. Amen. Jesus said it, so it was done. The man is still laying there. He is still invalid, and the bed is there. Watch the next phrase. And he took up his bed, and he did what? No mention of him exercising great faith. This is going to mess you up. No mention in him believing in God. God said it. He did it. And it was done. You have already been set free from the things that are holding you down. The problem is not the thing anymore. It is me and it is you. We like the bed. Come on, y'all, talk to me this morning. We like the pity and the sympathy they give us when we're in the bed. Come on, talk to me this morning. We like the attention. We like the situation. So we wallow in it and we're praying, y'all pray for me, I can't get up. God has already released a word. The reason the thing has us is because we like where we are. It has nothing to do with the ability of God. He's already set you free. Let me get real down to earth. So if you have a cigarette addiction and you're trying to get rid of it, just stop. If you have a euphoria shop addiction and you can't, <laughs> we're in Colorado, I can say this, and you can't let it go, just, just do it. Just do it. Because your deliverance is in the getting up, not in the laying there waiting. If your marriage is jacked up, just fix you. Just do it. Are you with me? Very, very important statement that I'm making. This does not require faith. It requires action on your part and on my part. Okay? Here's another one. If you're broke, stop praying. Get a job. Yeah. <laughs> As believers, we spiritualize things too much, and we stay in our condition way, way too long where this man had no spiritual belief, but yet and still God healed him. Come on, talk to me this morning. And he put into action the spoken word of God, and change began to happen in his life. Come on, say amen, y'all. Okay, let me, let, me, let me move, let me move real quick. Look at this real quick. It says, at once, verse 9, the man was healed, he took up his bed, and he walked, okay? Now, now, watch the second thing. I just wanted to share two things, two, two things. Is that, the, oh, they, they got rid of the, the big idea on the screen. I want y'all to see that real quick, okay? Can y'all put that back up there? Not that one, the, that one right there, okay? So here's the thing. He redeems us from sin. Secondly, he challenges us to do what? To do what? To do what? Come on, to do what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I am going to pursue change, if I'm going to, to, to get to the place where God would have me to be, God already released a word, and once I out, I can't keep doing the same thing and expect the change to stick. Turn your neighbor real quick. Say, neighbor, do something different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Watch the text. Watch the text. Now, that day, it says, was the Sabbath. Lord Jesus, that's a problem. Because <laughs> Sabbath means church folk. <laughs> so the Jews, Lord Jesus, the religious sect, 
scribes and the Pharisees and the elders and the deacon, choir members and ushers and the church attendees, the tithers, the prayer warriors. They said to the man, who has been healed? Y'all see that? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> this is funny, because they didn't even notice this man who couldn't walk for 38 years, all of a sudden is walking. They weren't concerned about what God had begun in his life. <laughs> y'all, y'all not get it. <laughs> they were more focused on what he was doing <laughs> versus what had happened to him. I need two people in here, because this is how church folk hack. You ain't supposed to look like that. Doesn't matter the fact that they came in church when they hadn't been there all their life, but how dare you come in here looking like that? I wish I had somebody in here. You're not supposed to eat that. It doesn't matter that they hadn't, come on, been doing this for God all their life. We miss what God has done. But we focus on what they shouldn't do. Here's the law. The Sabbath law said that you can't do no work. Now, the Jews had defined it specifically to say it's okay to work or carry a bed as long as there's somebody on the bed. But if the bed is empty, then that's work. <laughs> you see how we can get caught up in the nitty-gritty and prevent people from coming to Jesus because of our foolishness. Are you hearing me? The law, the law mess you up. Religiosity will mess you up. Church stuff will mess you up. Okay? Listen, we are working hard to get folk in here. It doesn't matter when they look like, what they look like when they come. Let them be because they didn't walk for 38 years and all of a sudden they're walking. We don't care what they're carrying. Let them come with the roll the bed and the crack pipes. Come on. And we don't care how they come. Let them come and Jesus will do the changing, not me and not you. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Come on, come on. Is this making sense? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor, you better leave me in my bed alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, so because Jesus has me here. Come on, tell him. Yeah, he has me here. Come on. He has me here. So you leave my bed alone. The fact is, I'm beginning to walk with him. Leave my doggone bed alone. If I got to carry it, I'm going to carry it. I'm going to Jesus. Folk just came out of gang members, just, just got out of the gang. Barely have been, what, what do you call that, initiated when they get? De-initiated, if there's such a term. Barely got out. They don't know what it is to pull up their pants yet, so they still walking like this. Oh, you a Christian now. Be leave my pants alone till God gets done doing what God has to do in my life. Are you hearing me this morning? Let God do his work. Quit trying to be God in the life of people. Let him be God all by himself. That's the problem with the church and why folk can't change. Are you hearing me this morning? Are you hearing me? Leave me alone. I'm going to get there. Are you hearing me this morning? Bunch of religious people. No different than the scribes and the Pharisees and the Jews. Forgot the fact that the man just experienced a miracle. What you doing? And bless his heart. Bless his heart. Watch this. I'm almost done. Verse 11, the man answered them. Watch this. The man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. Verse 12 is striking. They ask him. Who is the man who said to you, take up your bed? What church he go to? <laughs> he must be from the Springs. That's what, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so watch this, watch this. And it says, now this is striking, this is striking. They said to him, who's this man? And he says, now the man who had been here, look at verse 13. 
this is deep, who had been healed, did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in that place. This man met Jesus, but he didn't know Jesus. It's, it's possible, Deron, to meet Jesus and not know, not know, yeah, not know Jesus. Are you with me? Because here's the thing that I want you all to understand. Folk that walk like this, they just met him. They don't know him. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And, and the reason I go back to my vomit and I go back to the sin is because I met him, but I don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the church is filled with a whole lot of folk who met him, but they don't know. Yeah, yeah, let me, let me just go in. Y'all forgive me because I love y'all to death. I'm trying to say if you met him and you know him, you can't go back to the same thing you left this morning on your way to church because if you know him, he changes you. Come on, talk to me this morning. He met him, but he didn't know his name. He couldn't describe him. He referred to him as the man who healed me and had no idea who he was. It's possible to have met him and not know him. The church has an obligation to help people know who Jesus is. Are you hearing me this morning? And when I say the church, don't look at me. I'm talking about you. Not the building, the church. To help people know. Okay? If you want to make it in 2016, you can't just meet Jesus. <laughs> Got to get to know him. If you want to break out, you can't just meet him. That's what keeps you in unbroken out stage. You must know him. Does this make sense? Last thing and I'm done. Now watch this. Afterward, no, I don't want to skip nothing. Um, verse 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. Ooh. I like that. Yeah. Somebody going to get it in a little while. Yeah, I met him at church. Because you see, he never used to go to church for 38 years. He wasn't allowed. So he now he journed church. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going now. Are you with me? Because he met Jesus. So next step is go to church so I can know. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah. So I could learn more about him. So, so watch this. Jesus met him. Um, Jesus sees him at the temple. And then here's what Jesus said. This is an interesting verbal phrase. See you are well. And then he says, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Man, I wish, I, wish, I wish all of you all were Greek grammaticians to just see that in the text and to read it in its original nuance because the, the verb is ginomai, right? And it's, it's, it's in the perfect tense. I'm going to explain, don't worry, with an active voice, okay? Here, so here's what Jesus said to him. Look at, look at, look at, look at, uh, this is a sarcastic statement. I'm a, I see my stuff worked. The pool stuff would have worn out by now. Because uh, the perfect tense says, an action that occurred in the past, but it still has impact in the present. So when Jesus does something to you, it's done. The onus is no longer on him. It's on us to walk in what he did. So here's what Jesus says, oh, you done adjourned church. What, you in the choir? <laughs> but he says, I see you're well. I noticed that my healing has stuck. Now, watch the active voice. Now, if you want it to stick and continue to stick in the active sense, you have work to do. You change some things or something worse is going to happen. So watch this. 
the only person that can undo the miraculous of God is me. How? By not doing what he said. Well, I wish I, I wish I wish. Yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all going to get that tomorrow morning. You can get it about 2.45 after the score is um, good. Yeah, yeah. When the, yeah. You're going, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Y'all going to get that. You're going to get that, okay? Because he has already released the word. So watch this. Watch this. Let me give you some quick applications really quick. Hey, I've already caused you to quit smoking. Perfect tense. It's done. It's waiting on you to put the cigarette down. Hey, God, I can't release it. Who's stronger, it or me, in you? I've already empowered you to walk away from him because he ain't no good. But you don't understand, God. He pays the rent. (laughs) I've already released what I'm going to say. The active voice says, you now have to work with me in the work that I've already completed in you. Here's the problem. It has two connotations. Something worse is going to happen. Because here's how he says it in one parable. Um, When a demon leaves a house, if you don't replace it with something, he goes and he gets seven more, and he comes, and the house is in a worse condition than it was in the first place. You wonder why the longer you live, the worse your life? I wish I had somebody in here. Seems to be because God has finished his work, and he's saying, now you change. But we refuse to obey him in what he's already done. Eschatologically, that means end times, If you don't stop sinning, you're going to end up in hell. I know folk don't use that word in church no more, but in this church, we still do. Are you hearing me? We still do. Stop sinning. Because Jesus came to redeem us so we can change our lifestyle to spend eternity with him. Yeah, you get it. You get it. You get it. You kind of get what I'm saying? So if you want to have life more abundantly loud, if you want your 2016 to be all that God would have it to be, it's going to mandate and require some change. Turn to the neighbor and say, neighbor, you need to resolve to change. Come on, tell him again. Say, you need to resolve to change. Say it again. Say, you need to resolve to change. Now, now hear me, and, and then we're going to end on this. I understand contextually, that there was a mythical implications in the text where it says an angel will come down and trouble the water, and whoever steps in the water first would be healed. I get all that. But the truth and the application in the text today is that Jesus has showed up to trouble the church. (laughs) And so the water is stirring. (laughs) Are you going to get in or not? Come on, are you with me? Come on. The water is stirring because the word of God has been released and we have choice to make. Either we leave here the same way we came, excuses, was nobody here to put me in the water. (laughs) Or are you going to step in yourself? I don't know about you, but when I encounter God, I want to be a different person. Are you, are you, come on, are you hearing me this morning? I don't want to go into 2016 the same way I came out of 2015. Because really when I look back at it, it's the same way I came out of 2014 and 13 and 12 and 10. Heck, it's been since 1960 and I still have the same problem. I need to resolve to change. God has released a word and if I'm going to achieve breakout for the kingdom of God, I need to do something different. So put that slide on the screen. Come on, worship team. The next one real quick. Three things. I don't know if y'all could see that, but you can go on on Bible and download all these notes. Three things if you're going to resolve to change. Number one, we must be cognizant of the need to change. And a book that our leadership been reading called The ABC Moment, what the ABC Moment is, stop lying to yourself. You must be aware Believe that the situation is worse than it actually is, that you are in crisis, and begin the process of making a change. Two, you mistake, we, let me put myself in it, the initiative to pick up our bed and to walk out what God has already spoken about us. We got to get out of it. We must do it for ourselves. Are you hearing me? 
And then three, we must be intentional in changing the way we currently do things. Can't keep doing the same thing and expect something different. And if stuff isn't working out about you, quit blaming the folk that won't put you in the pool. You and God, me and God. It's vertical. Been an invalid for 38 years and God's saying, time to do something different. The good news of all of this, God left his home in glory. Traveled the cosmic constellations for 40 and two generations, was born in a stable placed in a manger to redeem us. He did all that for you. He thought I was worth saving. So he came and gave his life. <laughs> he thought I was worth keeping. So like an old smelly fish, he cleaned me up inside. He thought I was to die for. So he sacrificed his life so I can be free, so I can be whole, so as the church can tell everyone I know who he is. I am going to be different. Are you going to be different? Stand to your feet this morning. Stand to your feet.